All right, greetings everyone. Welcome to the June 6, 2023 meeting of the Mecklenburg County Economic Development Committee. I'm Commissioner Susan Rodriguez McDowell and I have the pleasure of serving as chair of this committee. So we welcome the public who have been provided a call in number to access this meeting. The agenda was sent out to those already on the distribution list. If anyone would like electronic copies of any presentation materials today, please make those requests via email to Keisha Whitley. Her email address is keisha dot w-h-i-t-l-e-y at mecnc.gov. So we will begin today's meeting with introductions and I will start with the commissioners. Um, I think I will start on my right and we will go across. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Jurell, District 4. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Meyer, and I did represent District 5. Good afternoon. My name is Lee Altman, County Commissioner serving at large. And we have a guest commissioner. Good afternoon. Mecklenburg County Commissioner Elaine Powell, District 1. All right. And so next we will go to the county manager and other staff. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Dina DiOrio, County Manager. Hey, good afternoon, Mike Bryant, Deputy County Manager. Good afternoon, Shahid Rana, Economic Development. Agustin Velasquez, Economic Development. Keisha Whitley, Economic Development. And Megan Witt, Economic Development. All right, and we do have some guests with us today. We'd love to, to uh, let you introduce yourselves. Uh, Todd DeLong, City of Charlotte, Economic Development. Okay. And I'm Sandy Thompson, Public Education. All right, fantastic. All right, well, thank you, everyone. So begin. we need to begin the meeting with uh, <clears throat> our minutes from May 16th. I move to pass. To... Well, I have a motion to approve? To approve. <laughs> second. <laughs> okay. The motion has been made by Commissioner Meyer and seconded by Commissioner Altman. All those in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> the meeting minutes for May 16th have been approved. Um, so Deputy County Manager Leslie Johnson will not be with us today. So I will now recognize Shahid Rana to introduce the next agenda item. Thank you, Madam Chair. And before I start, I wanna recognize County Manager and Deputy County Manager Michael Bryant. If you had any opening remarks before I start this presentation and hand it off to Todd DeLong. I do not have any opening. All right, well, let's get rolling. <laughs> well, thank you for this opportunity um, here. As you remember, on May 2nd, the City of Charlotte team, led by Assistant County uh, City Manager Tracy Dotson and Assistant Director Todd DeLong, who's here with us today, provided their updates on Eastling Yards. And as a part of that update, the city um, presented a high-level overview of the progress that's happening on the western boundary of the site with 10 Cinema and Crossland. And he also presented a high level overview of the proposals that were received for the balance of the site that was formerly allocated towards Tepper Sports. Subsequent to that meeting, the city of Charlotte agreed to continue its open communication and provide a status update for the balance of the site to this board committee. With me today is Todd DeLong, Assistant Director of the City of Charlotte's Economic Development Department to provide a presentation update for the Eastern Redevelopment Project. Todd, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you all for the opportunity to be back here this afternoon. As Shaw mentioned, we really wanna come back every so often and provide updates and clarity on what's happening on the Eastern portion of the site. We've been here probably for the last, I think, March, April, May, for the last three months we've been here. Uh, I feel like I need to set up a recurring meeting just to kind of and discuss what's going on with the site, which is a good thing because there's a lot of progress actually occurring on the site on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of start with just a review of the process that we've undertaken so far, get into an update on the evaluation of the proposals we received so far, and then get into the recommendations that we have and next steps. A lot of this will be repetitive to what you heard in the last meeting, and will certainly be repetitive if you tuned in to the city's Jobs and Economic Development Committee that occurred yesterday. A lot of the information, the material is very similar, if not the exact same information. So going through this entire process, we want to make sure we're maintaining the intent and the original intent for the site. The community engagement effort 
uh, that was uh, done in, throughout 2019 identified a really strong support for sports facilities as associated with the overall redevelopment. Um, prior to the opportunity with Tepper Sports and Entertainment and Charlotte FC, we had engaged in some conversations with potential partners, and we re-engaged in conversations with those after uh, Charlotte FC opted to move to a different location. Uh, in December 2022, the city received an unsolicited bid, which set forward a process uh, of an informal solicitation process that we had a public notice and requested anybody else who was interested uh, in doing a similar type of facility or amateur sports facility uh, to submit uh, by February 6th. This was not an RFP or an RFQ process. It was more of an informal process. Just as a uh, summary of some of the committee discussions from the city side, uh, March 6th committee discussion, we presented three proposals to the committee. Uh, some of the committee, committee concerns were about the public investment requested and the uh, basically the proportion of public versus private and uh, with re from the request of the proposals. Uh, the committee voted to extend the review period by 60 days and directed staff to accept new proposals during the extended review period. Uh, on the May 1st committee discussion, we revisited the three proposals that we discussed in March, and we also presented one new proposal. Uh, the staff recommended eliminated two pro proposals from further consideration, and the city's committee action at that time was to remove Eastland Aquatic Center and Target from further consideration for the eastern portion of the site. Uh, there was also discussion around uh, the idea of a public option. Is there a, a, a solution there? And that's something that the, the committee recommended we move forward with, and it's something we also discussed in this committee last month. Uh, in August, we would return with the committee with uh, update, and we also lay out a scope of work for the process for reviewing each proposal. After the May 1st committee meeting, we heard loud and clear from the community, as well as from some of our council members, that urgency is of utmost importance. So we tried to shift gears a little bit to try to move things up a bit, and which we went to yesterday with a recommendation to try to move forward a little bit more quickly as we go through the summer. So also want to remind everyone as we go through these presentations that progress is underway. I know this is a big site. We have a long way to go, and we are certainly on the way to getting there. Um, and sometimes it may seem like nothing is occurring, but every day there's activity, there's something else going on on the property. We had the groundbreaking in August of 2022. We had the first closing with Crossland Southeast last month. Uh, that is for senior affordable housing development, which they will start doing vertical on that development here shortly. Uh, the expected delivery date uh, for that project is uh, Q4 of 2024. We also anticipate subsequent closings uh, in Q3 and Q4 of 2023, which would be the mixed use development parcels and the single family and townhouse development parcels. As a reminder, what we have with the terms with Cross and Southeast and our development agreement, we do not transfer a property to them until they're ready to actually develop. So that helps protect our interest and we don't sell land and they do nothing with it and they can sit on it and flip it. And that also helps them save some, some money so they don't actually have to carry the cost or pay property taxes if they're not ready to develop. So the good thing is, is that once we sell land to them and transfer the land to them, they are ready to go vertical and actually start development uh, shortly. As you know, the county is... Uh, conducting community engagement for the four and a half to five acre park that would be on the western portion of the site. And as we continue discussions on the eastern 29 portion, we expect this to take about two years to get through. So this is, like I said, we have a long way to go and we're on our way of going there. A lot of folks just look at the dirt and they say, well, we're just moving dirt around. You have to move dirt to put, to lay the underground infrastructure. You have to move dirt to put in roads. So that there's a lot of work to, to be done on this, this property. These are the redevelopment principles that we started with in 2012. These were initiated by a uh, community. I think Charlotte East, when they formed earlier, they actually pulled these together. These are what we consider to be our North Star and how we look at this redevelopment. We look at these every time we vet a proposal for any part of this site, and we want to make sure that we're adhering to these principles as we're continuing through the redevelopment. Also, we wanted to just a quick reminder, there was some discussion in the last meeting about the community engagement effort. Uh, in 2019, we decided to do something a little bit different, sort of a non-traditional approach to engagement of a property like this. Uh, what we found was that there was a lot of meeting fatigue in the community. And they were tired of doing the same thing over and over and over again and not getting any action out of it. We also found that many of the immigrant and minority populations were underrepresented in the traditional engagement efforts. So we did a host of small focus group meetings, larger community meetings, uh, digital platform, email campaigns, surveys, websites, and so forth. And really, what we 
trying to get a more diversified approach to uh, accepting that feedback instead of just a few folks we're getting a, a wider variety of feedback that represents all of these shard not just a, a small faction some of the initial feedback that we received that reflects uh, that's more focused on this part of the site on this eastern 29 acres um, you know we asked the question of what the aspirations for the new eastland destination overwhelmingly overwhelmingly you can see is spark growth for the east side some of the things that really popped up on this was creating a destination uh, should be a destination for all to visit near and far, not just the Charlotte area to draw tourists. Uh, something like this doesn't happen or doesn't currently exist on the east side. Uh, sports facilities continue to be a, an area of excitement and interest. There was some anxiety a little bit at the time just because of the unknown. This was prior to Charlotte FC and Tepper Sports and Entertainment entering into the conversation. So there was just a little bit of unknown about what it was at that time. Thankfully, we're getting some greater clarity of where we're heading uh, over the next couple of months and uh, the last several months. And then arts and entertainment also was one that came up uh, largely during the conversation uh, about looking for space for entertainment. Is there some place to hold a, in a live after five type of an event on the east side? From the more active space feedback that we received, uh, as you can see here, soccer fields was the overwhelmingly response. Uh, followed by aquatics, amateur sports, and um, this broad category of other. Uh, so you can see that really that there was a, a, a large approach to get or a heavy desire to have active recreation in the area, particularly sports related uh, on this part on the site. This is another slide I think we've shown you previously just as a reminder. Uh, it's always helpful to remind folks uh, how much public investment has already been committed to the property. In all, we have about 50 to $55 million of public investment committed one way or another on the property. Uh, the city is about six, 36 to $38 million of that in the county coming in at 15 to 17, comprising the tax increment grant, as well as the park that's underway in a community engagement effort now. Moving now into the evaluations of the eastern portion of the site. Just a reminder, we're talking about this green acre here. A green area there is about 29 acres. Uh, the focus of this site has been re has remained on some type of sports or active recreation use that brings people to the site and to East Charlotte. Uh, it's a use that activates the site and complements the work that Cross and Southeast is leading and has underway on the western portion of the property. The proposal we've seen before is the Racket Sports and Entertainment District. This was from Carolina Serves. This is a reminder. It's the 67 racket court facility, 24 green clay courts, hard, uh, six hard courts, four red clay courts, three indoor courts, 24 pickleball courts, six padel courts. It would also include a learning and education center and surface parking for about 300 parking spaces. Uh, they're looking at uh, they were looking at 24 acres for the racket sports facility and suggested that the remaining five acres could be used for a subsequent development that would complement what they have as well as what's going on across the street with Cross and Southeast. The funding and land structure on this proposal, the estimated project cost is about $32 million. Of that, they requested the public uh, funding for $28 million, comprising a $17 million for the facility itself, which would uh, come from hospitality funds, and then $11.3 million in infrastructure improvements from the city. Uh, this equates to about 88% of the total capital costs would come from the public. Uh, they also propose $5 million of additional private funding, which $2 million of that would go towards operating reserves, and $3 million would be set aside for youth grants and scholarships uh, for the Carolina Service Programming. They, from a land structure, they were proposing a $1 per year ground lease for 99 years. The second proposal we're looking at is QC East at Eastland Yards. This was brought to us by uh, Southern Entertainment. Charlotte Soccer Academy and eSports Property Partners. This is a mix of basically three different types of concepts. We have athletic fields, uh, entertainment, and what they call the hub. The athletic fields would be six multi-sport artificial turf fields comprised of about eight acres. The entertainment would be an outdoor amphitheater with an indoor and outdoor venue of the hub. The hub, as they propose, is 20 to 25,000 square feet. Uh, so it would include a public event space, technology center, and focus on esports and STEM educational opportunities. The event capacity of this indoor space is 2,500 seats. Uh, this would host uh, professional and amateur esports events, music concerts, and digital entertainment area. Um, again, it's about 20 to 25,000 feet, and they also have space for about 530 parking spaces, 
and they are looking at the entire 29 acres. Phase one would consist of the fields, the hub, and the Charlotte Soccer Academy building and related parking. Their anticipated phase two would look at a future hotel, uh, an F&B slash entertainment area that'd be an outdoor venue with, think about food trucks or the container uh, uh, with uh, food and beverage options in it, something like that to actually bring something more of a destination and gathering space to East Charlotte. Their funding and land structure, they proposed phase one, the total project cost is $61 million with phase two at 22 million. When we're vetting these, we're looking primarily at phase one because if phase one doesn't occur, phase two certainly wouldn't occur. So we wanna make sure that phase one has the stability to actually to work and be financially sustainable over time. The private investment for phase one is 31 million and then 22 million for phase two. The public, public investment requested is 30 million for phase one of that hospitality funds would come into about 20, uh, 19 million with infrastructure reimbursement at 11 million. This equates to about 49% of the total capital costs would come from the public sector. From a community use perspective of the facility, they are suggesting apprenticeships, adult uh, workforce training programs, after school programs with tech education, uh, neighborhood access to fields, uh, community meeting spaces, uh, community-oriented programming, think uh, senior-oriented tech training, things like that with the residents who would be uh, living in the, the senior affordable housing. And they would purchase the land from the city at market value. And we talked about uh, briefly in the last conversation about the idea of a public option. This came about from the reliance on public funding to support a lot of these facilities. And we began thinking, you know, what is we're looking at putting a lot of this funding, if not all of the funding from the public side on this, why not? We, why don't we just own and operate and do it ourselves? Uh, we wondered if it was a better idea to have a dual focus. Could we actually better operate a dual focus type of facility that focuses on economic impact and tourism development and community impact? Uh, rather, can we do that better than the, the private sector could? We've had multiple conversations with other city staff, the county staff, CRVA, and others just to kind of get an idea whether or not this is feasible in the time frame that's being desired from this, the, the community and for the site. Um, we also looked at the economic structure, what the programming might look like, and had several conversations over the last several months or last uh, 30 to 45 days. Again, we looked at a, a multi-sport indoor outdoor facility that sports that focuses on sports, uh, tourism, and community amenities. Um, after the initial review, we figured that the option was not as attractive due to remaining uncertainties around timeline, budget, and partnership structure. And so after multiple conversations, we opted that it's not considered to be a very viable option for this site at this time. I think through these conversations, there's some merit there to continue conversa uh, conversations about this concept. It's just that this site with the timing and the budget constraints, the programming desires, I just don't think we're gonna be able to get it done with the amount of, uh, with everything else that's going on with the site. and. The, the partnership structure and so forth. So it's, again, these came from conversations over the last 45 days. And uh, it, again, at this time, it just, it just wasn't determined to be the, the most viable option for us today. Friday afternoon at about two o'clock, we received another proposal for, uh, called Eastland Yards Indoor Sports Complex. Uh, this came to us from a group of uh, Synergy Sports, Viking Companies and Rad Sports and Edge Sports Groups. Uh, Synergy Sports is a consulting company with extensive experience in sports facility design, and they have over two dozen P3 sports projects in development across the U.S. Viking Companies is a national developer ex with experience across multiple sectors. Uh, Rad Sports, who is a partner of Viking, they specialize in facility management, planning and development and event management. And Edge Sports Group, they have over 30 years of private and public design experience, and they own and operate nearly 20 facilities across the U.S., Local project partners as part of this proposal include uh, Jason uh, Boudry with Synergy Sports, uh, Stormy Scott with Banbury Partners, Carlini Ivory, uh, Raquel Rob Robinson, Robert Bolton, and Titus Ivory. Again, we received this on Friday, so we've only had a few days to actually vet this. We haven't done a full vetting of this proposal. Uh, we have had an opportunity to do some Q&A via email over the weekend. Uh, this is uh, their proposal is about 100,000 square feet of indoor programming, which would include 10 full size hardware basketball courts that could transfer into 20 volleyball courts and then also 40 pickleball courts. 
there'd be an ability to overlay a 200 meter banked competition track. Uh, it would have a portable indoor turf, seating for 1500, uh, sports per performance space, concessions and bar and fitness center. Uh, potential tenants would include medical users, physical therapy, et cetera. Uh, they would also house a Charlotte Learning Academy that would have STEM spaces, childcare, workforce development programming options. Those are some of the things we want to continue vetting and getting a better understanding of what that actually is, how much space is in there for that. Uh, from the outdoor side of things, they're looking at or they're proposing two FIFA regulation soccer pitches that would could break down into four to eight youth pitches or eight youth fly football fields, two futsal courts outdoor basketball course and jogging trails, a playground, 700 surface parking spaces, and a potential hotel. For phase two, they're looking at uh, one to two indoor ice rinks, uh, potential creative parking solutions with either parking above retail, structure parking, uh, family entertainment options, with, for instance, an arcade, uh, outdoor commercial space, uh, both retail, medical, and so forth to support the activities and the uses of the facility. Estimated project cost for phase one is $68 million. They are proposing that the private side would come up with 40 million. They would take on cost overruns. Public investment requested is 28 million, a 20 million to support the amateur facility in the fields with an 8 million to support the infrastructure improvements. So public investment equates to about 41% of the total cost of phase one. From the community use side of things, they are proposing that 20% of the total available time would be available for the community to use. Of that 20%, 30% would be no cost amenities uh, programs, 20% would be discounted rate amenities and programs, and 50% would be full rate amenities and programs. They have, they're requesting a $1 per year ground lease for the entire 29 acres. I think we touched on some of these the last time we spoke, just talking about some of the evaluation criteria that we're looking at when we're vetting these proposals. Uh, the main criteria we're looking at here on the left side of the uh, left column is team qualifications and experience, uh, financial strategies and qualification, project approach, schedule, uh, community impact and access. You know, some of the key areas that when you're looking at proposals like this, we want to make sure they have strong capital and financial support, as well as they also have demonstrative experience of operating on the long term a successful event space, because what we'd hate to see happen is we partner with somebody and we uh, put in a, a large chunk of investment into this and then three years later it goes dark or they're not they fail to operate it and we have to take it over and we're basically right back to where we were again this slide and the following slide will show you basically side by side comparison of the information we presented so far of the three different proposals that we've been reviewing for example you can see the economic impact 100 million for the racket sports and entertainment district over five years uh, for the QC at Eastland Yard, it is an annual economic impact of 111 million. And then the indoor sports complex uh, are suggesting or proposing a um, 129 million annual economic impact. Again, this is just a side by side comparison for your reference. These are the evaluation results uh, that we have taken with Carolina Serves, Racket Sports and Entertainment District. Some of the pros, we felt that they demonstrated a market demand for increasing the supply of courts and larger complexes in the region. They certainly have a demonstrated track record working well with the public sector, and they have an impressive commitment to engaging youth and offering affordable programming for low-income residents. Uh, the Carolina Service Program is really fantastic for what it does in the community. Um, some of the cons, uh, public would be taking on a greater share of the financial risk and the capital cost. The economic impact for this type of use is heavily reliant on larger events, and the potential impact is certainly not as strong as team sports and those types of uh, facilities. Uh, parking may be inadequate for higher quality uh, events that are necessary to generate the type of impact uh, that they describe. And there's limited opportunities for community use outside of racket sports and the Carolina Service Youth Programming. QC, at East, QC East at Eastland Yards. Uh, we think that they have an impressive mix of activities across the 29 acre site, certainly an attractive mix of public and private funding structure with 49% coming from the public. Uh, demonstrated ability to manage a variety of events from entertainment, sports, and tech. Uh, the development team brings a relevant complementary skill sets and experiences. Uh, the economic impact and initiatives are, are, are significant that would support job, local job growth, local business expansion, and development of tech oriented skill sets. 
And the concepts align really well with the community feedback and the preferences for job creation, soccer fields, and creating a destination in East Charlotte. Uh, on the con side, uh, one of the major ones that stuck out is that the larger events, particularly with the concerts and festivals, things like that, could place some burdens on the surrounding communities with respect to the demands for traffic and parking. There's also a conflict of interest that came up in question that we wanted to address and just want to make sure we're addressing it with everyone. In the beginning, there was some discussion about uh, the, the Carolina eSports Hub. Uh, Councilman Bakari is, he owns less than 10% of the Carolina eSports Hub. Um, according to our city attorney, there is no direct conflict of interest and we have full authority to enter into an agreement with eSports property partners who would actually be the owner entity. And from the team itself, we received uh, clarity from them. Uh, again, Councilman Bakari owns a minority interest, less than 10% of Carolina Esports Hub. He has no ownership interest in Esports Property Partners. Esports Property Partners will own one third interest in the development rights of the project. Carolina Esports Hub does not have an ownership interest in QCE's project. The K Carolina Esports Hub plans to conduct esports related competitions in the venue based upon short use time, uh, short term use agreements, which would be five to 10 times a year at a standard market rate, which would be similar to any other project. So, just to kind of rephrase that, Carolina Esports Hub would be a tenant and it would be a short term tenant over time and not an owner entity. So, there's, there is no conflict whatsoever uh, with this. The indoor sports complex. Uh, initially, from our initial review of evaluation to date, uh, they again have a diversity of potential impactful uses and activities across the 29 acres, uh, demonstrated demand for the proposed facilities in the Charlotte market. Uh, they have success uh, ex experience with successfully implementing similar P3 structures with a mix of public and private funding. Uh, they have an attractive mix of public and private funding structure with 41% coming from the public. Uh, the concepts also align well with community feedback, supporting amateur sports facilities, and there's a pretty strong potential here for catalytic impact for nearby businesses and job opportunities for residents of East Charlotte. On the cons, uh, there's a potential burden on surrounding communities from entry, increased traffic and parking, which we're going to see with very similar across the board on facilities like this. Uh, low to no cost community use needs to be vetted further, and some of the high areas highlighted in yellow also need to be vetted a little bit further mm -hmm. as we continue conversations with this team over the next uh, week or two. This kind of just graphically illustrates the comparison of the three with respect to some of the community goals that we heard. Uh, the icons, they represent which proposal would have the greatest impact or do the most to further the stated community goal. If there's a blank space, it doesn't necessarily mean that proposal doesn't do it. It just means that one or two others might do it better. For example, creates a destination in East Charlotte based on our evaluation, QC East and the indoor sports complex do a better job. Uh, the sports field and active recreation use, uh, we think all three of them do a really good job there. A low to no cost use for community use uh, of the fields and facilities. They all three have proposed community use there, but we think the tennis, uh, the racket sports district uh, does a little bit better. Generating sports tourism and impact, the QC East and the indoor sports complex uh, have, this, have the edge there. They all activate the site year round. From a job creation standpoint, the QC East and the indoor sports complex do much better. Uh, workforce and talent development opportunities, uh, certainly Eastland Yards, QC East and Eastland Yards, uh, with their hub, their STEM programming, apprenticeship opportunities, and things that they're offering there. Um, and then with the Community Learning Academy with the indoor sports complex, it seems to be attractive. Again, we need to vet that a little bit more to understand more what that actually is and how is that benefiting the community. And then uh, increasing the small opportunities for small local businesses. Uh, what we've heard from the QC East at Eastland Yards team is about their experience of engaging businesses with their festivals and making sure that everybody uh, from small businesses, local business has an opportunity to participate in those events, as well as possibly having have an opportunity to participate on a longer term basis in their F&B concept or their um, uh, some of the retail spaces. So overall, when we're looking at these, our goals are to find the best long-term solution for East Charlotte. Uh, we have a continued continue commitment to investment in East Charlotte and facilitate transformative redevelopment as we've been talking about for the last five years or so. Uh, we made a staff recommendation yesterday to eliminate Carolina serves from further consideration of evaluating. And we also recommended a June community meeting to solicit some additional feedback 
uh, and focus on QC at Eastland Yards and potentially Eastland Yards Indoor Sports Complex. These recommendations were unanimously approved by the Jobs and Economic Development Committee yesterday. <clears throat> we would look to begin the community input on the viable solutions uh, online starting this week. We should have it on our website uh, later this week, and I'd encourage you all to take advantage of that and provide your feedback as well. Um, and then we have a community meeting in June, which we're trying to schedule uh, now as early as possible, but we're looking towards the end of June at this point in time. Just some summary comments from yesterday's committee meeting, what we heard from the committee members is, you know, keeping the community front and center was of, of utmost importance. We want to put right before fast. Um, we want to make sure that we're affirming the community priorities with respect to community use versus economic impact, because sometimes they don't always align with each other. Um, the selection needs to have solid capital backing and financial strength for long-term uh, sustainability and stability. And we need to create a gathering place for East Charlotte. And for the June community meeting, the purpose is to gather additional feedback on one or two viable proposals. Tentative dates we're looking at is June 24th or 28th. We're also currently looking at earlier dates, just a matter of aligning schedules uh, for everyone to be there. Um, the proposals teams would be available to present their vision and gather input from community stakeholders. Again, it's trying to reaffirm the, the feedback we received from 2019. Uh, making sure that there's, we understand what the priorities are with respect to community use and economic impact and economic catalyst for the east side. Um, and then also address any areas of concern there might be with any of the proposals. Uh, for example, we've always already heard some about parking, traffic increases, and things like that. So we want to make sure we are clearly understand what the community feedback is on those areas as we continue to uh, vet and have conversations with each of the proposing teams. In terms of our next steps, and we're continuing to support Cross and Southeast and what they're doing on site and <clears throat> assessing the future in infrastructure needs on this eastern portion of the site. We don't want to hold them up by any means. So we're making sure that we're keeping them going and moving along. Uh, community engagement begins with an on -site, online site, as we just mentioned, and then a public meeting in June. And then in July, we'd have uh, basically pulling all that feedback together, working with each of the proposing teams and really determining which is that lead proposal. Uh, to bring forward to council for a vote and further uh, reckon or and or further evaluation in August. Um, so I know that was a lot fairly quickly. Um, happy to entertain any questions, comments uh, from the committee. Thank you very much. You, okay. Um, can I just ask one clarifying question before I um, open it up? You said that um, for the Eastern 29, it would be a two-year process. D is that like a beginning to end or is that just to make a decision? Like what's your uh, time? Frame? It's, I'm thinking more beginning to end because once we make a decision, we're going to have to get the proper agreements in place. They're going to need to do their own site work due diligence. And so it's okay. going to take a little bit. Just because we make a selection doesn't mean development starting the next day. That's where we're trying to make sure and leveling expectations Okay. how long these some of these projects can take. All right, I'm going to start with our committee members first, um, beginning with Commissioner Altman, if you have any questions. All right. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to I'd like to understand what this committee will be called upon to vote on ultimately, because I may have thoughts or opinions, which I'm happy to share, but I want to understand Ultimately, to what extent do we have a binding way in here? So I think I think that's a really good question because you know just to sort of take a step backwards, you know we I had an agreement with the city manager, um, and I think there were other people in the room when we had that conversation that this mm -hmm. the city and the county were going to evaluate. If you look on slide thirty one, where you have all the little balls in the chart, uh, particularly around the QC East Eastland Yards. Um, Proposal. There was an agreement that the city and the county staff were going to were going to evaluate that collectively together. Um, that didn't happen, um, and so we did not. These little balls in this little chart here does not have any input um, from county staff. Um, and the Eastland Sports, as as uh, Todd indicated, came late on Friday. But again, we did not weigh in on any of the um, on any of these basketballs that you see in the chart. The staff recommendation is not county staff's recommendation, it's city staff's recommendation. So the only takeaway that I can take from that is that the city plans to be the sole financial partner in this deal, because if the city is going to continue to move forward without county input, I cannot recommend to this board that you make a financial contribution to this. So if that's the way the city wants to go, 
I'm okay with that, but I don't want you to feel like you, sh you should be forced to make a financial contribution when we have not had a seat at the table to vet these proposals and weigh in on what we think we might want at that site. Okay, so that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm disappointed to hear that. Um, I certainly would have hoped, um, considering all that's come, uh, how far we've come and all the conversations we've had that um, county staff would have been a part of preparing and vetting for the presentation today. Um, it, it actually makes me wonder what is the value of this particular meeting but before us. But let me just ask again my question. Is there any potential for us to vote again? Is not this more just a courtesy it, update? Yeah, I mean, if you're not going to make a financial contribution, then this, then the county would have no reason to vote on this project. Okay. All. Well, I'm presuming we're not going to be asked to make a, a contribution because we sort of level set that we wouldn't be doing that anyway, and you your staff was not included. And so in that case, I appreciate the uh, the update so that we get a chance to learn more, but I'm going to proceed under those assumptions uh, for the reasons that you've said. Um, and 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 also, Dina, do you in a do you have any other sort of takeaways from what you've heard? I just want to give you an opportunity to weigh in publicly before I ask my questions because I'm interested if you do have any other big takeaways. I'm not 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 at this time. Okay. So it looks to me like the second and third option are the ones that um, give the most amount of diverse activities, Todd, um, is that is that a fair statement? Because, you know, if, if folks are not racket sports people, you know, I want this to be an amenity that that they enjoy, because I think that's probably a fairly small percentage of people who like actively play racket sports, even though it's fantastic. Um, so is is that a is that your is that a fair sort of yes. reading of what these options are? Yes. And how would you characterize the non-racket amenities of the second and third option and, and sort of more layman's terms? So in the, the QC East proposal, I would characterize the non-sports options with the hub and the festivals. The hub is really intriguing because it, with the esports con concept, it's relatively new to, to Charlotte. Um, from the information we received from them so far, we've had successful events with uh, tournaments, esports tournaments in the Charlotte market. They're looking for more space and more opportunities to have those events in Charlotte and be more competitive with Raleigh and other places around the Southeast. Um, the apprenticeships, the STEM opportunities, uh, the educational opportunities, I think those are something that's really intriguing for us in terms of economic mobility and having an opportunity to actually bring a different type of workforce development and training to East Charlotte that doesn't currently exist. Um, and then from the festival side and event side, it's, you know, we talked about entertainment uses and there's not a lot of places to go for entertainment on the East side. That's something we heard loud and clear. There's people have to travel away from the East side to go to anywhere that to see any kind of entertainment. So there's something I, I think it has a little bit of for everyone in that proposal. On the indoor sports complex, uh, the the community Learning Center, I think that's something we're still trying to vet and get a bit more clarity around what that is. And we've had it for a few days. We really haven't had a great deal of opportunity to kind of work it into the details of that particular proposal. But I, I think from the, the community use with the fields and the indoor facility, the indoor facility generally, not speaking about this one, but generally indoor facilities offer more flexibility in what you can do inside of them from community meetings to um just non-traditional, non-sports type of activities that you can use those facilities for. So they have a great flexibility to do things that are non-sports related. Uh, and then also with the additional space, they're uh, suggesting with some additional retail, uh, hotel, and some other ancillary development that could complement what's going on with Cross and Southeast and with what they're looking at doing with that indoor facility. Thank you. And I must say, I'm disappointed that the the conclusion, if someone can bring the slide back up about the public option not being under consideration or um, if, if I can get the exact verbiage. May I ask why? Because uh, I think that there was a lot of potential there. Um, there was some excitement there. And I mean, I guess you've given some reasons why, but like, did you explore it with the county at all? Like, did you have any meetings with the county? Uh, there were several meetings to my understanding with the county um, from a variety of, of levels where looking at uh, the CRVA, what their wants and needs were for an indoor facility. Did those match with the county needs for an indoor and or outdoor facility? 
with the Eastway Recreation Center, is there really a need for additional indoor space in, on the east side, given the size of that facility and the utility and usage of that facility? And then make kind of seeing whether or not the goals and objectives of the CRVA and the county and the city all kind of align together. I think it's going to, from my perspective, it would take more time to really figure out that, that out and really determine, kind of hone in on what that specific programming is. The CRVA may not see the need for as much outdoor facilities, where the county might see a greater need for outdoor facilities. So they're trying to figure that out and get to the, what is the, the appropriate scale and partnership structure between the CRVA, the county, and the city, figuring out what that actually looks like. I think from those conversations, I think, again, there's some things that rose to the top in terms of there's some really good ideas there but actually vetting them out, getting something that's actually feasible, getting a structure in place, doing it in a timely way just wasn't going to occur. Just and, and what did I read in the media about a, a skating rink? I don't think I heard that mentioned today. But not, I, yeah, has there, has there not been some discussion about putting an ice skating rink so on the side? And if so, where does that fit in with all of this? In phase two of two weeks. Oh, okay. Phase two, they would be looking at one to two indoor ice rinks oh, okay. there. All right. Thank you for the time. Do you have any? I'm just disappointed that, I mean, we're not, I mean, thank you for the presentation, but it is disappointing. Um, a park is an economic driving force. So I'm really disappointed about that. Really disappointed to keep seeing indoor. Um, that seems to be winning and especially disappointed on that one slide, 31 you're recommending the racket sports be taken off the table, but the two that are still on the table have low to no cost community use of fields and facilities. It's not checked. So that's disappointing to me too. I don't, I mean, I know we don't have much of an opinion on this. So um, I just want to make, it's my opinion that we should have green space there. That's all, thanks. All right, Commissioner Jarrell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Todd, thanks for the presentation. Um, so Commissioner Meyer, I would I would take a little different lens. Um, I do think we have a, um, a big stake in this because we've got an investment on the other side of that site. And um, I think it's all tied together. Anytime you make an investment and you've got other components, I think we have to have a seat at the table because we have to protect our investment. And I do think it's, um, disappointing because uh, I thought that Deputy County Manager Johnson was um, being consulted and, and um, Director Jones and um, I know the County Manager has weighed in as well but I, I did believe we had a seat at the table um, because we have to protect our investment I mean we're not in the business of giving out money and then making sure that we don't have an investment you know our investment covered uh, with public dollars so that's um, so I, I do think that we should have a voice. I think our staff should be in that room to evaluate these proposals to see how it aligns with what we have going on, what we've invested in on the other side of the site. I, I don't even I don't think that's outrageous. And Todd, I'm hoping that um, um, we can solve to that. I think I think we should. I think putting all the minds in the room, the experts um, from different lenses and bringing those all together to produce a product for all the citizens and residents that we serve is probably the best solution that um, our constituents need <laughs> to have all the all the stakeholders at the table. Um, so I'll, I'll start with that, but uh, I, I do think that we should um, bring the experts in from, from all sides because I think um, our staff could probably provide a, a, another lens or, or give us uh, some perspectives that would be certainly useful um, to the constituents of the East Side. The other thing, with respect to the community engagement, um, can you put that slide up for me? I wanted to, this one thing I was, uh, yeah. So when we, 
with bullet point number one is the, is the community vision from 2019 and before still the desired vision. How, how will that, what, what does that look like, Todd, when you, we, we have narrowed it down to two proposals? The cake is already baked. So we're asking the community, so we're asking them, does this align with what you want? I mean, help me help me understand that because why why would we just say, hey, out of the two that are here, which one do you like? So or something to that. Why why are we trying to to figure out to lay out 2019 what we said and then try to fit it into these two proposals? So and, and maybe the language of that just needs to be adjusted a little bit. I, we're not going to go back to the recreate the wheelness. Uh, we want we certainly do want to affirm and reaffirm that what we've heard is still accurate. Uh, you know, obviously some things change over over time. But we certainly want to affirm that thing, things are accurate. We do have two proposals that we're moving forward with, and that we want to have the feedback based around those two proposals. We are still probably finalizing those questions over the next day or two. What will actually be asked um, from the engagement side, and we certainly want feedback on any pain points that come from these two proposals. Uh, if the community comes in and says, "Hey, we want a pool. We want we want an Olympic size pool." How, how is that going to be evaluated by you guys? Well, I think we've already taken the aquatics out of it, so that wouldn't be something that would be available for us to proceed with considering. So, there, when you're doing community engagement, you're 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 kind of opening yourself up to a lot of different questions or requests and uh, Christmas wish list items. And that's something we've got to take into consideration as we're reviewing all that feedback, how it aligns to these two proposals, what is what aligns, what does not align, how do we factor that in and how do we move forward in a, in a proposal? Well, I think my, that's that's my point exactly. When you if you're if we're gonna go if we're gonna open up this bottle, I mean it's gonna open us up to a whole lot of you know just stuff from arbitrary stuff from from everywhere and and if it's not going to necessarily change the mix I, I just think we have to be very careful about the way the engagement looks and and the the way the question and it sounds like you're saying that you guys are looking at those questions and trying to figure that out and so how, how are you um what's the how are we going to get to the to to make sure that the the voices are diverse? And, and the other thing that I want is I really hope that you all will consider those people that are approximate that two eight two zero five two eight two one two and two eight two one five zip code. I think their voices should be weighted the loudest and the heaviest. If this is going to be a, a total community engagement, any and everybody can participate. There's got to be a way, in my opinion, to isolate those voices that are proximate to the site that are east side residents so that their thoughts carry the most weight mm -hmm. around what we want to see at the site. So that's something that I personally would like for you guys to consider. Okay. Um, and then with the proposals on the evaluation metric, you you touched on this and, and it was a question that I've had. I um you know, the community's talked about economic mobility for quite some time. And I, I did not necessarily see that baked in as as an, an evaluation component. But when you are talking about that area and, and where it sits and resides, um, I'm hoping that will be a a real driver with respect to economic mobility and also greater visibility on when we say a project's going to generate 50 jobs. Uh, and then the ancillary jobs are 700 or a thousand. Like, what are we, what kind of jobs are we talking? Are we talking part-time or are they livable wage jobs? Are they like, what, what is that? What does that mean? Um, so, you know, those, those are kinds of things that I'm, I'm hoping that we can, can vet out as well or get, get some additional information around because. Absolutely. And as for example, some of them had laid out prospective tenants that could be in there, whether it's physical therapy office or um, a different type of medical office user. And so you, those are certainly different types of jobs than that might be somebody who is there for a festival, you know, five times a year. And so we're, we're definitely looking at what is the full-time equivalent that could actually be directly on the site, as well as potentially that would be, they would support of other businesses and outside of, outside of the site. And do you guys put any um, MWB participation um, component? I know I talked about that last time, but I think that 
that's really important to to our side. Um, and I suspect you guys are doing the same thing and vendor well. participation and, and that kind of thing. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And that's based on the formula that our Charlotte Business Inclusion has. And so basically on what is the budget, what, is, what are the budget line items for that construction project? And then how does that equate to the availability of those contractors and subcontracting firms? And then that percentage is, is derived. So that, that so it's baked into your contracts as you yeah. as we Correct. move forward. Correct. That's perfect. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, thank you. So I I just wanted to touch back on what the county manager said about the county investment. And so could you go to slide um, 10? And on slide 10, it shows all the different components. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to make sure I'm getting this straight. The uh, eight to 10 million of county dollars going to the 4.6 acre park. That's one investment that we have. And then the TIG, of course, is the other, which is the 11 million. Um, and so I'm noticing how in the total, it's showing 15 to 17 million for the county. Is that because the 11 million is really like a split thing or is the whole 11 million? How does, how does that work? No, um, I think that's actually just an error in the math where the 15 to million was used in the previous park estimate that actually had a lower cost estimate for the park. And so I just need to update that. So that's, it really should say uh, 19 to um, 21 million. Okay, that's what I was um, wondering there. That. So that really is, to Commissioner Jarrell's point, a large investment for the county. Like that shouldn't be like, oh, well, I guess, you know, like we need to make sure this whole thing works um, because that is a large investment. Um, and so uh, uh, I guess, so I, I think the thing that I'm trying to separate in my mind is there was more, was there was was the city looking for more investment from the county on the east 29 or what are they calling it the eastern 29 um acres it is were yeah. they looking for that from us or or you just I, I think we stated um, in march during this meeting that we are not seeking additional okay. funding from the county okay the that's what i thought like but that. the reason that we're here today is because the other 19 to 21 million matters correct Okay. Absolutely. And we want to make sure that as a partner on the overall site, that everybody is kind of brought up to speed around the same time and that we're communicating effectively together. Okay. It's just, just I to guess clarify the... one thing. If there was, if we were pursuing a public option, then there would have been county participation. So to say that you were not going to seek public or county participation Correct. is not hundred percent true. Well, that was in March when we said that. And then in May right, is but... when we talked about the potential for a public option. Correct. So we, and... so that would require county participation Correct. and some of the proposals even though they were knocked out, did call for county participation. They public, but we were assuming that- Well, some of them said county. Did they? Yes. Yeah. We were assuming they would have been city and we weren't coming to the county or for additional support. Okay. So uh, what, what we're saying here is that the point is we would have put more money in um, if there was something happening on that site that really aligned with our values or our priorities. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is um, I think Commissioner Jarrell's point about the investment that's already on the other part of the um, property as a whole is nothing to sneeze at. You know, like we want to make sure that this is really what all that it can be for the community. And that's why we wanted to invest in it. So we can't lose sight of that and just go, oh, well, you know, we're out, you know, we're out, we're out of this now because uh, it's super important that this, you know, really, really something good happens on this for the community and not just kind of, you know, oh, well, we tried and we're just settling on something. Um, and also I just, could we go to slide number eight? Um, the, I'm really interested in how this um, graph is showing spark growth for the east side. That is the largest um, part, you know, of the response that what people's aspirations are. So I'm wondering if we could, uh, if you could just talk a little bit about what is meant by growth. Um, it, does that mean, uh, you know, growth in, you know, 
um, property values, growth in, like what, what is it growth in? Certainly. So growth, I think, from the community engagement we received and the feedback we received is more pertaining to jobs and economic opportunity. Okay. And okay. creating places for people to have more opportunities for work, uh, more opportunities to create and establish businesses or to expand their businesses. Mm -hmm. I think that's where that spark economic or spark uh, growth for the east side is coming into play. Okay. I think that's super important, um, and I think it might get a little bit lost sometimes in the discussion, and uh, I just really wanted to highlight that. Um, I, I, I want to give um, a, a, some time over to our, uh, our, our, our colleague, Commissioner Powell, if you have some, some comments. I know when you brought us the uh, public um, idea the park idea. We were real excited about that. And I would love to hear um, your thoughts today. I feel like I'm at a funeral. <laughs> so so um, I just want to start that. I want to say it again. It's really distressing when slides are put up and there's no input from county staff. Um, you see a lot of relationships in life where people say they're partners. And you can say your partners. And then there's action. There's action required for a partnership. And I think that my colleagues sitting at this table have worked really hard to have strong intergovernmental relations. And we're serious when we reach out to other bodies. So it's just beyond distressing to see that um, county staff was not involved in this. Any, any public investment of public dollars should benefit the public. And so when I see that on slide 31, that the line where the low to no cost for community use of fields and facilities isn't something um, that they're getting a, a gold star on, I am concerned. Uh, this community needs to have use of fields and facilities. And I, I think everyone knows I lived there for a significant amount of time in my life. And so I know, you know, I don't, I love community engagement, but I live there. And so I know what the community values. Uh, and I'm not surprised to see <laughs> lots of soccer balls. I mean, the, that part of the community really values soccer. Uh, I'm, and the reason I say I feel like I'm at a funeral is I'm sorry to learn that the city bailed on this uh, public option solution so early. Uh, I made a polite request to reach out to park and rec staff to see what kind of proposal they could come up with. There wouldn't be any charge for that. Uh, they are the experts. They're experts on community engagement. They're experts on responding to what the community wants. and. And I think you would have been pleasantly surprised at what they could have come up with quickly. Um, they are the experts. Um, and I, I ask that you really consider if you're gonna do a lease with anyone, why is it 99 years? I mean, that's way too long in my opinion, you know, 99 years. We haven't gotten to the details of the lease term with the indoor sports facility. The 99 years was the request from Carolina Serves. Generally on a ground lease, if they are gonna own a building, they're gonna to wanna to have some longevity to it because the 99 years effectively acts as a fee simple transaction. Those are some things that we were weighing as well with respect to, is it better to sell or is it better to lease? What kind of conditions can we put into that, that the terms of those agreements? Uh, reversion rights if they don't perform or how what kind of governance structure is there uh, with the operating group this those are questions that we're going to be answering with them over the next uh, month and a half or so and then as we get into the development agreements with whichever group is selected and uh do you have a commitment to maintain like i, I heard at one point you said something about selling the land for market value I wonder the wisdom in that. Uh, it seems like it'd be a lot smarter for the city to maintain ownership. 
So that's that's exactly what we want to the way and balance. What are the advantages, disadvantages of that? Uh, a lot of it comes down to the big picture of what the proposal entails, what it delivers for the community. There are certain things we might be able to negotiate with the fact that we would be selling the land. Uh, it opens up additional revenue opportunities that we could put back into the project and reinvest into the project. It also, uh, from a lease side, it, it does provide us longer ownership of the land, but also depending on how you structure the lease, it may not give you as much rights because just because you own the land, you're basically leasing all the land to somebody else. And if it's not structured wisely, you've basically relinquished your rights to that ownership. It, you, see, you effectively don't own it. Well, you own it, but you don't have the rights that you normally would if you own land. Well, we have lots of good lawyers that can figure out how to maintain ownership. But uh, that concludes my comments, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, do any other committee members have any additional in light of the conversation questions? I have just one more for the county manager, unless anyone else. Okay. Um, can you remind us, Dina, about the, the three things that we had asked for back when it was a yeah. pepper deal? Um, I can remember. One was um, economic opportunity on the side of the park, not the park, the park where we're that we're building. Was that the west side or the east side? West side. West side. Um, and that the land would remain. Um, open space in perpetuity, but that was when we had um, Tepper mm -hmm. as part of the, at the table. And then the third one, do you remember what it was, Sha? Do you remember what it was? It was in perpetuity um, if Tepper were, were to leave. And then there was also community use of the facilities. Community some use amount of the facility. Community That's use right. Facilities. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, and those three things were negotiated. That was what we, we uh, agreed to for the TIG. For four, what was that? It was it was for the TIG, although they weren't linked specifically. But you, when you voted for the TIG, you said these are the things that we wanted to make sure happen when we voted on the TIG. Okay, so but then you were nice enough to let them go forward the construction on um, on the west side because the timing of such would have undermined yes. that deal. Right, but still keeping those three things front of mind about what we said was important. Mm -hmm. nice so we would expect that that that's going to be honored mm -hmm. as we move forward. And, and absolutely. And I, I just, because there were a couple of comments about this on the lack of a soccer ball or basketball on the low to no cost community use, they provide proposed approaches to doing that. We just felt that the Carolina serves group actually did a little bit better had a slight edge over it. That's why they, there's no, icon in that box with the other two and those are something that we definitely want to have in further conversations with each of those two proposals about their their use of for the community uh the availability 20 percent to me just doesn't seem like it's enough over the this 365 days i understand there's conflicts with tournament days and things like that but there's there's things we got to work through with them and that's something that we want to continue thinking about as we're having conversations with both of those other proposals is how do we maximize the use for the public in, in a way that's meaningful and not just something that is thrown out as an arbitrary, hey, here's your here's your public use. Okay. So we're trying to have those conversations with them to get something that lives to the intent of what we talked about in a previous meeting. Okay. I just really appreciate Commissioner SRM bringing that up because absolutely on this project in the future mm -hmm. collaborations, if we don't see this honored, not only in the letter, but in the spirit, mm -hmm. Of what our manager negotiated is going to weigh very heavily on us in any future dialogue. Commissioner Durrell. Yeah, well, full transparency. I was in favor of us moving forward with the tip. Uh, I was pushing that um, very heavily because, again, um, the, like I've said, you know, people have waited for a very, very long time to get some level of movement and to, to stop the process at that point, I, I think would not have served the residents well. And sometimes we have to, to, to give a little um, as well as take. And so, I, I, uh, so I, I, I wanna make sure that I'm clear on what my position was with respect to pushing that uh, during this committee meeting. Um, the other thing, uh, Todd, is Crossland Southeast at the table? Because I would suspect that, you know, having the whole site um, in how much weight goes into their lens with respect to what's being proposed. 
Oh, a, a lot. Can we have the agreements we have, they certainly have um, rights in terms of their involvement in deciding what goes on over there. Uh, there's restrictions, use restrictions of what cannot go on on that side of the site. So they are they are heavily engaged in what this process is, and kind of providing their comments, feedback, and and thoughts so far on, uh, for example, on the site design. What does that look like? Uh, what are the things from an infrastructure perspective each of those proposing teams needs to look out for with underground infrastructure? What not to plan to put a building on top of? Making sure that we're all working together from a land development side to um, just the traditional development side that everybody has on the same page with what that looks like. So we're not having to restart all of this over and over again. So Carlson has met with each of these proposals mm -hmm. and each of the teams and has continued to have conversations along the way. So with respect to the, the feedback around county staff being at the table and part of this, obviously if Crossland is there, we're absent, um, you guys are there. What 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 are what are your thoughts? You know, and I'm not asking you to speak for the manager, but generally speaking, like what what are your thoughts about us being at the table? Because last time you were here, um, I requested for all stakeholders to come together to actually look at this public option more so. We were trying to do that. Again, I guess obviously a decision was made that that just wasn't viable, but there still seems to be a little question mark. I, I guess it, it I, in my opinion, it's never too late to do the right thing, right? And so if we see where we missed, I'm hoping that we can go back and figure out a way that we can be involved and provide feedback. I, I think um, I think that's just really, really important. I think everybody has to put um, uh, uh, has to put things aside to make sure that we produce the best product for Absolutely. our residents. So, will we can we get a commitment from you to follow up uh, with the county manager uh, or someone to follow up with the county Absolutely. manager to say what that mechanism should look like moving forward? Because we've got a really short runway, really short window to get this thing nailed and, and nailed down and, and um, our lens is, is important. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. And so um, then Dina would just need you to keep us posted on, on what that communication looks like. No, I, 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 I don't want you to have to chase. I, I hope, yeah, I, I hope not. And, and I hope whoever's listening to this and Todd, I appreciate you being here, but this is, this is so important. This is one of the biggest investments we've made on the East side um ever maybe and uh with the revenue that it's going to generate what it means uh, i think uh we we've got to do it so thank you todd for that um can i just ask keisha um or megan is there anyone on online that's making comments that we're not hearing or seeing no, no comments. okay all right fantastic um, all right, with that, um, if there's no other comments on this, this, this will conclude this item on our agenda. Um, going once, going twice, anybody, anybody? Okay. Thank you, Mr. DeLong, for being here, and I hope we didn't hold your feet to the fire too, too, uh, too hot there, uh, but it really is important to us, um, you know, this investment, so thank you. All right. Thanks. Sure, sure. Okay, so at this time we're going to be uh, going into closed session. We need a motion. Hold on one second. We oh, have one more oh, project there's... update. Oh, there is. I'm sorry. I thought we'll that was the next thing. Session. Oh, okay. Get for project breakpoint. Oh, sorry about that. Got ahead of Just myself. Just up the presentation right now. All right, fantastic. Thank you. It'll be a one slotter um, brief update as a follow up, and then we'll run into closed session. Which okay. All right. Cool. A brief update as well. Thank you. Keisha's pulling up the presentation. So thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The back channel conversation is going on. That one is not the one. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Madam Chair, thank you for this opportunity to provide a, a brief update to Project Breakpoint. Go to the next slide here. Um, a special joint meeting uh, between the city and the county happened on May 10th. 
2023. And Project Breakpoint was also presented during the May 16th Economic Development Committee meeting. The county staff has had conversations with Project Breakpoint team to discuss project timing, uh, funding requests, economic impact, community impact, and engagement. Um, the next steps also include further due diligence by staff. What I mean by staff is uh, the county. Um, additional information by Project Breakpoint. Um, and also they'll be looking for a request for local support. So with Project Breakpoint, they're seeking uh, state funding as a part of their um, gun, uh, funding gap and state funding requires also a local match. So uh, as you know, that the city and the county um, has been presented this project. Um, we have not received a formal proposal uh, from Project Breakpoint on what that means for the county in regards to funding, timing, and the like. Um, a lot of the follow-up conversations that we've had have been subsequent comments from the previous Economic Development Committee meeting on May 16th, and also the joint meeting that we had earlier in May. So those conversations, uh, again, regards to timing, funding, economic, and community impact. So MWSBE support, uh, the usage of public facilities, community engagement and partners, and the like. So there's still more information to, to flush out um, between Project Breakpoint and the follow-up comments that were provided from the subsequent meetings. Um, and we do not have a, an official proposal in hand at the moment. So I just want to provide you with a, a brief update um, on that. That was a part of the conversation and your request from the last meeting that we had. So I just want to let you know that we did have a meeting um, with that team and we're looking to receive more additional information in which we'll present here um, to this committee. Okay, great. So we're looking for a number, is what you're saying. We haven't gotten it yet. No, we haven't received anything yet. Okay, all right. All right. Anybody have any questions about this item? Hearing none, thank you very much for the update. Um, I move to go into closed session. Second. We'll go into closed session. All right. Um, Right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Do I hear a motion to adjourn since we've completed our, our so agenda moved. items? Second. All right. Um, moved by Commissioner Meyer, seconded by Commissioner Altman. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, just had to do it. Mark has to be the <laughs> Bill Malik over <laughs> here. <laughs> All right. You are overruled. Yeah, I'm overruled by the chair.